Well, welcome everyone to Elbow Lake Environmental Education Center's fifth virtual public outreach event for the summer of 2020. We're very excited to have you all with us this evening for Reptiles, Amphibians, and You webinar with Kenny Ruland from Reptile and Amphibian Advocacy. We will be hosting virtual outreach bi-weekly summer events this summer, so please stay tuned on our Elbow Lake Environmental Education Center's website and social media. My name is Megan White, and I'm one of the Outreach and Stewardship Interns at the Queen's University Biological Station. Myself, along with Lindsay Ray, the other Outreach and Stewardship Intern, and Sarah Oldenberger, the Outreach and Teaching Coordinator, will be facilitating this event tonight. We ask that you would please keep your audio and your video turned off throughout the webinar and type your questions into the chat box, which is the icon is located at the bottom of the Zoom webinar. We will be monitoring the chat box throughout the presentation, and we'll have a question and answer period throughout and as well as as well as at the end of the presentation. Please note that we will be recording this webinar and it will be available after the presentation on the official CUBE's YouTube channel, should you need to leave early or you would wish to share it with your networks. We would like to begin by acknowledging the territory that we are thankful to be situated on. Queen's University is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. Specifically, the Elbow Lake Environmental Education Center is situated on unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territory and is part of the Algonquin land claim by the Algonquins of Ontario, currently under negotiation with the federal government of Canada. Acknowledgement of these facts requires recognition of the pre-colonial history of this land and the peoples who lived here and continue to live here. The cultures and spiritualities of Indigenous peoples are connected to the land and the land is an integral part of their ways of knowing and living. These knowledge systems are continually evolving in relation to the land and its other inhabitants, both human and other than human. The Kingston Indigenous community continues to reflect the area's Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee roots. There is also a significant Métis community and there are first peoples from other nations across Turtle Island present here today. I'd like to take this time to welcome and introduce our speaker for this evening. Kenny Ruland is a passionate conserv conservationist with a focus on the herpetolo herpetological world. Founding Reptile and Amphibian Advocacy in 2015, he has focused on educating thousands of individuals about these at-risk groups of animals. In addition to education, he has traveled the province with several organizations conducting research. Now focusing on, this, on his field work, Kenny has worked as a consultant, mainly studying at-risk turtle species in the Kingston area for the past three years. Kenny, we are very excited to learn from you and I'll pass it along to you now. <clears throat> Thank you, Megan. Um, can everybody hear me? Yeah. All right, awesome. All right, so thank you very much. Um, as uh, Megan was saying there, my name is Kenny Ruland. So I run a project. It is called Reptile and Amphibian Advocacy. So what we do, um, the project mainly started as an outreach project. So we started by educating the public on our native reptiles and amphibians. So um, there's a few reasons for that. I'm going to start sharing a slideshow just for you guys to look at when I'm doing this. So, all right. So the project is called Reptile Amphibian Advocacy. So our goal is to contribute to the conservation of Ontario's herpetofauna. So the reason why we're doing this is because reptiles and amphibians in general, um, they're not doing well globally. Now, again, when people are thinking of rare species and endangered species, uh, a lot of the time people are thinking of, you know, megafauna. And by megafauna, I mean large, you know, charismatic mammals. So we're talking about elephants and tigers and stuff like that. That's the stuff that, you know, gets a lot of the attention. But there is species right here in our own backyards that are also disappearing. Um, so according to CHS, <coughs> excuse me, which is Canadian Herpetological Society, Canada's reptiles and amphibians are doing worse here than anywhere else globally. Now, I think that's, you know, kind of hard to believe for a lot of people because when you think of the tropics and stuff like that, um, again, you hear a lot of conservation issues in those areas. But again, here in Ontario, we have um, a lot ourselves. So from that, 44% um, of amphibian species and subspecies um, and 65 of 65% of reptile species and subspecies have been listed as endangered, threatened, or uh, special concern by Kasuic. So these designations are given, um, you know, by government organizations, and how they're assessed is there. There's like there's a there's a 
designation. So the lowest on that list would be special concern. Um, so when species are special concern, there's there's protection for individuals, but they really don't have too much going for them. Um, so for example, map turtles are a species of special concern. Um, trying to think of a snake species. So the ribbon snake, that is also a species of special concern. So the next step up is threatened species. So that's our rat snakes, our blanding turtles in this area. So those turtles, um, their protection carries, sorry, those species, their protection carries a bit more weight. Um, so when these species are found, you know, action is actually taking place. Um, when you see fencing put up on the sides of highways and stuff, that's because, you know, there could be blanding turtles in that area. Those are the species that really get things done. And then, of course, um, the last one is endangered. So endangered, those species, they're very close to extinction. They're not doing well in these areas though, at all. And then after that comes extirpation, actually. So on the bottom part of the screen there, um, there's actually four species that have been already extirpated from Ontario. So that's the spring salamander in the top there. And the last observation was in the 1800s. We have the uh, northern cricket frog. The last observation was around 1993. Now, our only um, venomous snake species left is the Massasauga rattlesnake, as most people would know. But most people do not know that we also had another venomous snake species. So down here, um, the timber rattlesnake. So those were um, extirpated around 1941 was the last observation, and I think it was the Niagara Gorge. Now, again, this snake species was killed off just by humans. Um, direct persecution is how the, this species was extirpated. So, of course, habitat um, loss contributes to that as well. But these snakes were sought out to be killed um, and extirpated, and, and the humans did a good job of that. So Ontario has 52 extant species um, and subspecies of reptiles and amphibians. So those are the species that we still have left in the province. And then I'm gonna to go to the next slide um, and we're gonna go through some of the species in the area. And I kind of um, edited this presentation towards the Elbow Lake area. So these will be species that you could see in um, that area of Ontario in the South Frontenac area. So in this area, you know, north of Kingston, we have um, about five species of turtles. So you have the Blanding's turtle, we have the Eastern Musk turtle, we have the Midland Painted turtle, Northern Map turtle and Snapping turtle. Um, and again, I'm pretty sure most of these species can be found in the other lake area. I, uh, I haven't done too much looking in that spot specifically too much myself. So for snake species, actually, um, today happens to be World Snake Day, by coincidence. I uh, almost forgot to mention that. So I went out this morning before the rains to try to observe uh, some snake species that did not work out, unfortunately, uh, to cool out and it started raining uh, a bit sooner than I thought. So we, we did not get lucky on World Snake Day today. So in this area, we have uh, the DK's brown snake. So that's a small, brown species of snake, uh, they're, they're pretty common. Now I haven't seen those at Elbow Lake myself. We we'll also have the Eastern Garter Snake. That's the most common species of snake in this area. Um, the, oh, we got a notification up here. Yes, questions. If you guys have any questions, um, you can feel free to ask them throughout. Uh, Megan is gonna collect them out and we'll take a pause if, uh, if you guys feel the need to shout out a question. Oops. There we go. All right, so Eastern Garter Snake. Um, again, I'm sure everyone is quite familiar with them. That's kind of a backyard snake. You know, you can find those in the middle of the city. Here in Kingston, where I live, uh, they are quite common. So the Eastern Ribbon Snake, they are listed as special concern. So they are a species of, um, sorry, a species at risk. And uh, those guys, they look a lot like a garter snake. Um, they do have some differentiating features though. I don't have any photos up of this right now because I would take a long time to go through. Um, we only have so much time, so I'll uh, maybe save that for another presentation. So they have a, a small white crest in front of their eye. They look just like a garter snake, but a lot of people define them as um, a high definition garter. So 
their their lines or their stripes on their body are really really clean is a good way to describe it and they actually have somewhat of a maroon stripe along their lateral so along their side which uh, most garter snakes do not have and then the uh, gray rat snake so that's a pretty popular snake around here um, again there's two populations in ontario uh, left of this species so there's a carolinian population which is listed as endangered um, i have not seen that population they're not doing well in the carolinian area of ontario uh, southwestern ontario um, up here though in the great lake st lawrence population um, actually right around Ebel lake you you can observe them there and you know that's uh, advertised there um, they can be found there they can be found pretty much you know a little bit north of kingston um, about an hour north so they're very very large snake they're our largest species in um, the country so they get you know in excess of six feet long they're usually quite dark but the ones up in this area actually they have a lot of pattern even the large individuals um, and if you you know you get close enough to them you can actually see some color in this patterning so a lot of people think you know the gray rat snake or black rat snake some people still call them um, that they're just, you know, a, a jet black snake. So if you actually look at the top of the page here, there is uh, a photo of a juvenile rat snake. So you can see the patterning towards the front of the body there. And usually towards the end, um, they kind of darken up and, and get more black. But I have seen some pretty dark individuals. So the next species in the area we have is the Eastern Milk Snake. Um, it's kind of a medium-sized snake, red in color when they're young. They kind of dull out into a brown-colored snake uh, with age. The northern water snake, they are often confused with rat snakes in this area. Um, they do get quite large and they're dark, so people automatically think rat snake. Uh, one feature that I uh, tell people to look for to easily differentiate them is the scales. So water snakes have heavily keeled scales. Um, and what that means is they have like a small ridge in the middle of each scale. And it gives them this rough look and a rough feel. Uh, rat snakes do not have this. So rat snakes have very smooth, smooth scales. And the smooth green snake, which is uh, my personal favorite, they're uh, quite pretty. They're also found at Elbow Lake. They're a bright green snake. Uh, they're a small species and they have no pattern at all. They look quite tropical. They look like they do, do not belong here. So uh, Anne says, we're fairly sure they saw a red-bellied snake earlier this year in Kingston. Um, that would be unexpected to me. Uh, it's likely it could have been a DK's brown snake. So they look again, very, very similar. Um, DK's brown snakes, they kind of have spotting going down the dorsal, so going down their back, which almost, almost looks like uh, a, a set of stripes, so two stripes. Now, the red-bellied snake does have uh, a set of stripes going down its back, and then, of course, the belly is bright red. So I'm not sure if you turned that snake over, but if you did, um, I'm not sure if it would have a, uh, a red belly or not. Now, the red-bellied snakes also have a spot on the back of their head, kind of a light spot. Um, and part of their Latin name actually stands for that. Whereas the DKs kind of have, um, some people describe it as like a mascara. They have a line going uh, around their eye. So those are some features that, that you can look for. Another question. Nope. All right, I'll move on. All right, and uh, Ontario's lizards. So if we only have one, uh, that is the five-line skink. You can see one at the top of the screen there. So again, like the rat snake, there's also two populations. Um, the Carolinian population down in southwestern Ontario, they are endangered. So again, all, all of our um, southwestern species are not doing very well. And uh, again, it's because there's a lot of development down in southwestern Ontario, a lot of agriculture. And up here, the uh, Canadian Shield kind of saves all these species, I feel. And uh, these guys, I believe, are also found at Elba Lake. 
frogs and toads. Uh, there's a, a lot of species in this area, the Kingston area around Elba Lake. So we have the American bullfrog, uh, American toad, the western slash boreal chorus frog I have there. Now, the reason I have it like that is because um, there is some data coming out um, and hopefully it'll be accepted by the government where the our chorus frogs that are currently called the western chorus frog, uh, their common name will be switched likely to the boreal chorus frog. Um, there's some genetic work being done in the area and. Uh, Stephen Lahid at Queens, actually, he's um, doing that work. So we're, we're probably going to see some changes here soon with, with that there. So gray tree frog, they're also are pretty common in the area. Green frog, a northern leopard frog, these are all pretty common species for people. The pickerel frog, that's actually pictured at the top. Um, now, when I was out today, actually, we saw a few hopping around before the rain. Uh, they look very similar to a leopard frog, but there's a couple kind of difficult um, differentiating features in that species. Now spring peeper, that's uh, the loud singers in the springtime, and the wood frog. So salamanders, I've never actually found any salamanders at um, <coughs> Elba Lake, so I'm going off of uh, what I know is in the, the surrounding area locally. So we have the blue spotted salamander, the eastern redback salamander. I'm quite sure, you know, there's probably four toed salamanders in that area. Um, they're pretty rare, though, they're pretty hard to find. The eastern newts and the yellow spotted salamander. Uh, so it's pretty late in the year to find salamanders right now with how dry it is. Again, they're most of them are underground at this time of the year, at least the most salamanders, the yellow spotted and the blue spotted. You see them more in the springtime when they're breeding. Um, of course, newts are in the pond, so it's kind of a bad time of year to uh, be looking for salamanders. So I'm just going to quickly go over um, just a couple of threats that our native reptiles and amphibians face, unfortunately. So of course, the big one is habitat destruction and fragmentation. Um, so you know. Development, we all see it happening every day, tons of construction going on. Um, you know, of course, it's destroying habitat. You know, the, the species do have these protections put in place, but only so much is done. And of course, you know, money kind of trumps all. So I just have a couple of stats that I saved here. And in the Kingston area, there's apparently less than 25% of forest cover left. And um, that comes from the Environmental Commissioner of Ontario on this map here. And according to Ontario Nature, there's less than 30% of our um, original wetlands that remain in southern Ontario. So road mortality is another huge one. Uh, these are actually uh, a yellow spotted salamander and a chorus frog that I found on a road that uh, thankfully got moved off. So road mortality is a huge one. Now the work we're doing right now, um, we see a lot of it. So we do a lot of road surveys. So we're actually collecting data from, you know, animals that get hit on roads. Um, so a lot of time we're, we're pulling over, seeing hit snakes and turtles on, on the side of the road, um, you know, safely pulling over, moving them off the road, collecting the data and um, saving it to be input at a later time. So again, we've like, there's stuff that I've been involved in before where um, there was a bunch of rat snakes that got hit on, on uh, Highway 15 and I noticed that it was kind of a hot spot. So I went and uh, recorded as much data as I could and you know, we're hoping that that can be sent to MTO and maybe something can be done in the future. You know, that's how these, these turtle fences that you see pop up all the time um, are getting implemented on the sides of the roads is uh, people recording data, you know, so sending in those observations of um, road mortality. So direct persecution is another one, of course, um, which is really unfortunate. So like I was talking about the timber rattlesnake, they've been completely extirpated from the province due to this. So again, a lot of this is out of fear with snakes. That's a big one. Um, snakes are constantly killed out of fear. And again, a lot of the time that's just because people, um, again, they just don't understand them, right? So I have a few points on um, how you can help if you're willing. So a couple of these are habitat creation and stewardship. So, you know, it's as easy as uh, 
you know, not cutting your lawn so often, cutting it at a certain height, uh, planting native species, you know, you can create high vernacular for species. Um, Toronto Zoo actually has a lot of really great um, resources on their website to show you how to build turtle beaches, high vernacular for different species, ponds as well. Uh, volunteering in citizen, citizen science, sorry, I was just talking about that. So again, just sending in your observations to um, the right organizations. Um, and again, this data goes to help save these species. And some don'ts are, you know, you don't want to be using lots of pesticides and insecticides when you're out in nature. So I myself, when I'm doing field work, um, a lot of the time I haven't worn uh, like bug repellent in years. I don't wear sunscreen either. What I do is I just dress for the occasion. So I, you know, wear long sleeve shirts and pants when I do my field work. I cover up for ticks. You just gotta prepare. Um, again, don't harass species at risk uh, if you don't need to. So you know, if, if an animal is on the road, it's fine to move it. But you don't want to be harassing species just just for the fun of it, of course. Um, again, don't destroy habitat. I'm sure everyone knows that. You don't want to be um, out there kicking rocks around and stuff. And a big thing is people out observing species sometimes will destroy habitat um, unintentionally, right? So if, if you're out and you want to be looking for these species, you need to do it ethically. So if, if you're flipping over cover, you know, like a board or a rock, <clears throat> you need to be sure that you're putting that back. So um, I was saying I'm going to go over some of the local projects that we're working on right now. Um, so right now we're working with uh, the Land Between, which is a, a nonprofit organization, and Scales Nature Park. So we started a contract where we're searching for, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, specifically species at risk reptiles and amphibians in uh, these counties here. So that's Hastings County, Lenox and Addington, Frontenac, uh, Lanark and Leeds, and Grenville County. So we're focused on focusing on any species at risk, uh, but what we really want, again, like I was saying, is those threatened species. So the species that, that get things done, um, that get habitat protected and, and, and road protection as well. So we're focusing on Blanding's turtles, gray rat snakes. Those are two species up in the South Frontenac area um, that, you know, are observed. Now, Eastern hognose snakes and of course spotted turtles um, they can be found in a couple of these counties. Now, these are really rare species. We're not expecting to really get observations of these. Um, but if you guys do see them, it'd be great to get those observations. So we're just kind of focusing on the Blanding's turtle and the uh, gray rat snake. So this um, clear blue outline that you see on the map here, that is our boundary for observations. So we're working within this line. Um, we are kind of focusing on Frontenac County and Lenox and Addington right now just because it's uh, kind of close to home. And here is um, kind of a closer view of the map there. So, so what we're doing is we're trying to, trying to fill data gaps. Uh, species have not been seen and get observations and then protect the habitat because you know, we have a map of where these species have been seen. Um, we want to fill those in to try to get more habitat um, around them protected. So a few of those areas I just wanted to shout out is like the Sharbert Lake area. Um, so up here, we're looking for observations up in this area. Uh, the Ardock area, which is up here. So this is in Frontenac County. Um, down in Lenox and Addington, which is down here. This whole area like the Northbrook area over to like St. Ola. Um, we don't have observations of any Blanding's turtles there either. So that's kind of another area that we're focusing on. So another project that um, we're involved in this year, not as much as I would like to be with uh, the whole unfortunate COVID thing going on. Uh, we started a project last year with Friends of Kingston Inner Harbor. Um, so that's a nonprofit uh, here in Kingston. So we started a telemetry project to track northern map turtles to their hibernacula. There's a couple of um, developments that are happening along the Cataraqui River, right in the habitat that these turtles are utilizing. Um, so we went through the process, got permits, partnered with Queen's University, 
we ended up putting transmitters on um, six female map turtles last summer. So this is one of them. So um, NOX, it was her code name. I thought it would just be interesting to uh, show you guys. So what we would do is um, capture the turtles. Uh, we mark them and you can see a small hole up here in her uh, marginal scoot there. So she has three holes in her shell there. Uh, they don't affect her at all. And it's kind of like cutting your nails, it's just on the outsides there. So her name was Knox, her code. She had uh, this transmitter here. She actually still has it on to this date. We're still tracking her now. And she was tracked all the way from um, basically downtown Kingston, which I'm gonna show you now, all the way up to Kingston Mills last fall. So we wanted to track um, where they're hibernating. And it kind of blew us away because we were actually expecting them to be um, overwintering down here, kind of closer to downtown Kings, you know, not so far out of a um, trip. But uh, the map turtles, they have a really, really long range. She ended up going over seven kilometers to uh, Kings and Mills to the locks there. And uh, that ended up being where most of our turtles overwintered. So it was kind of a surprise. Um, it is great data though, because it shows that they're using the whole river. And uh, if, if any of you are local to Kingston here, you'll, you'll know that the third crossing is uh, unfortunately going in right here. So there's a uh, overpassage going over top the river. Um, the construction is going on right now and these turtles now have to pass this. Um, so again, without this data, we wouldn't know that the turtles are using that passage and have to now pass this construction that is going on. Um, so last year we um, did some consulting with the developers and they're, they're trying to make up for um, what they're doing in that area there. So that's kind of all I have to uh, talk about the project right now. Um, if you guys have any questions, uh, you can probably send those in now. And I'm also going to bring out a couple live animals to show you guys. Um, that's always pretty interesting for folks to see them. Now, usually we do a hands-on type of thing. Uh, of course, we can't do that with the COVID, so that's we're doing the online thing right now. Um, I usually try to get people to you know, get up close with the animals, though a lot of people have a fear of snakes. That's usually what I bring out. We also bring out a couple turtles, and it's uh, nice to get people up close and hands-on with them and get over their fears. Thanks so much for that, Kenny. That was very informative. There we go. Um, and hopefully people are able to submit some observations. I have one question so far from Lindsay, and she's wondering, do you know why a fair number of species are designated not assessed? Um, yeah, so that's actually a really, really good question. So I think funding has a lot to do with it. So there's very uh, limited funding from the government to do this research. Um, and again, a lot of the funding goes to species that are already assessed and that are not doing well. So I think they kind of just um, assume that a lot of species are common. Like for example, the smooth green snake, um, that's my personal favorite species. They are uh, not assessed right now. And again, people that are in this field that are in this field for a, a long time and have been doing this forever, you know, they can see these declines in species personally, um, but because the government isn't looking into them, they're, they're still considered common, right? So I think funding has a lot to do with it. Um, and uh, again, just people not being interested in maybe some of the common species because they're, they're still considered that. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I've got another question. Um, okay. Someone was wondering if what, should they, what they should do if they see a black rat snake, would it be best to email you? Yeah, so um, basically we have uh, on the Facebook page, I kind of close it quickly at the end there. But um, Reptile and Amphibian Advocacy Facebook, so you can send there. You could also send me an email. I think I have a recent post on the page actually of how to do that. Um, if you would want to write down my personal email, it is just Kenny, so that's K E N N Y, then the letter B in Rulin, so R U L L A N D at gmail.com. Um, so you can send observations in that way. You could also send them on the Facebook page.
So I'm going to go um, grab an animal. I was just looking at Hannah's comment there. Mm -hmm. Not enough data available to estimate the population size. Exactly. So yeah, not enough data, um, not enough funding to get that data. So just one second, Meg. I'm going to go grab um, analytical crowd. All right. <laughs> now, she's not going to be happy with me because she's actually in the shed right now. So uh, you guys can see that. So I'm not sure how good the lighting is. So uh, I'm not, it's not too clouded up. So this is an eastern garter snake. Um, so again, this is probably our most common species in Ontario. She's kind of a fair size for garter, not exactly fully grown. As you can see, she's shedding right now, so her eyes are kind of cloudy. Let's say hi for you guys. Again, I like to get people um, close up and hands on with the animals as much as I can to help them get over their fears. But uh, this will kind of have to be the, uh, the best we'll get to do right now. So, so as you see, they're, they're pretty easy to ID, the garter snakes. They're a dark snake. Um, they have one stripe going down the back there, two stripes going down each side. The garter snakes are really, really variable. Um, so in a few parts of the province, they actually come in a lot of different phases. So some are completely black. Um, some come in kind of red colors, green colors, blues. There's a couple of really cool ones posted online recently, actually. So I'm just going to put her back and grab another one to uh, kind of focus on local species here. But of course, you can only do so much. So again, a lot of these uh, native species, you, you can't just go collect them out of the wild because they are protected, of course. Um, now, this guy is a little special. So this is a northern water snake. So this is a species that again, a lot of people have a fear of because they see them at beaches um, or while they're swimming and stuff. And they're actually quite curious. So a lot of the time they'll approach people, um, which people do not like with snakes a lot of the time. Again, it's just out of curiosity. Uh, a lot of the time I tell people, if you kind of wave your arms as soon as they realize you're a human, they get scared, they get scared, sorry, and they back off. So this is kind of a younger individual. It's actually really, really pretty. Um, they're really variable as well. So this one is, uh, it has a heavy pattern. So it has a lot of striping on it, as you can see. But as they get older, they can kind of lose that and um, get pretty dark actually. Very neat. I've got a few more questions for you. Yep. Awesome. Anne was wondering um, how you can tell the difference between the leopard and the pickerel frog. Okay. Um, so that it's, uh, it can get a little bit difficult. Oh, here one sec, I'm just gonna put him back and... So the leopard frogs, uh, we actually saw both species today while I was trying to find snakes. So the way most people will try to um, differentiate leopard frogs and pickerel frogs is that most pickerels kind of have squarish spots on their dorsal, so on their back, um, whereas leopard frogs kind of have more circular spots. The pickerel frogs are a bit more squarish. They're usually brown in color. Um, and the lateral lines on each side of their back, they're usually a really, really gold color. Um, that's one thing that really stands out for me. And then their thighs, um, right in their groin area, usually kind of has somewhat of a yellow tinge to it. Um, again, they can be kind of difficult when you're not familiar with the species because they're, again, really variable, like their pattern. I've seen uh, pickerel frogs with circular patterns before. Um, but another good uh, ID feature is that the leopard frogs have kind of a light halo on their spots on their back. So when you look at the spot on a leopard frog, um, if you look around it, there's usually like a lime green um, ring around it. Very neat. I've got a few more snake questions. Yep. Um, I'm just gonna grab another snake actually. Oh, perfect. I can wait till you're back then. No, that's fine. I actually hear you just fine. Okay. Um, Gina was wondering that when they went to Lemoyne Trail with her mom, um, that they saw snakes and she, they were wondering if they're always dangerous. Uh, no. So any of the snakes that you saw in uh, the Kingston area are completely harmless. So all of the snake species in Ontario, uh, with the exception of the Massasauga, um, are considered totally harmless. So snake bites, they're 
quite superficially, you know, uh, being in this field, having to catch snakes and stuff, you, you do get bit. And I want to mention that, you know, catching snakes and stuff, I rarely get bit. They rarely actually bite as a defense. They have, uh, you know, many other defenses that they like to use first, uh, such as musking or fleeing. So any snake species on Ontario, you have no need to worry about. Uh, Massasauga rattlesnakes are only found in the Georgian Bay area. Um, mm -hmm. A couple of spots where you're not likely to find them anyways. And again, if, just like any wild animal, as long as you leave it alone, it's, it's going to do the same. Um, someone else was wondering if you're aware of king snakes being in the Gananoque area in the past, like in the past 40 years. Um, so there are no uh, like true king snakes in uh, Ontario. So we do have the eastern milk snake, which um, resembles a king snake and is actually a, it's in the same family, so Lampropeltis. Uh, those are pretty common in this area. Mm -hmm. Now, they're, when they're young, they're kind of a reddish color um, with a saddle pattern on them. And as I was saying earlier, as they get older, they kind of darken out a bit. Um, so that's likely what you would be seeing in that area. Now, this here, uh, so I was going to try to focus on local species. This is still from Ontario. Uh, this is the fox snake. Now, this is actually a western fox snake. So there, these, this species is found in the States, um, but again, very, very similar, almost identical to our Eastern fox snake found here in Ontario. So they're another species uh, at risk, again, in the Carolinian zone. Um, they're listed as endangered, unfortunately. And then uh, there's also a Georgian uh, population in the Georgian Bay area, and they're listed as threatened. Um, so these guys, they get pretty large. Um, I think about five feet, it's maybe the largest they get. Uh, they get a bit bigger in the Georgian Bay area than the Carolinian population. Now this guy's in shed, so he's not happy at all. Uh, he's not as pretty as he usually is. Now the Westerns, they're not as colorful as the Eastern species either. So the Easterns have a really bright orange head on them. Um, these guys are a bit more dull. Very neat. Um, another question from Gary. They're wondering if Boa constrictor snakes are common in Ontario, or if they're usually bought as a pet from a store? Um, so yeah, they're common as pets for sure. Uh, but again, they're not a native species. Uh, they, they have been found released before, you know, unfortunately. Um, sometimes people uh, will release their pets, as you should not do, and they're found out in the wild. Um, but no, they are not from Ontario. I'm just going to put this guy back. One more species to uh, show you guys here. So this one's not a snake. So I switched up a little bit. Uh, this one is not found in Ontario. It's a little bit dirty right now. So this is, uh, this is a Florida box turtle. Uh, so he's just a young guy right now. He's kind of buried in some dirt there. So he's not as pretty as he could be. Now, Eastern box turtles have been found in Ontario before. Um, I'm not sure if you can really consider them native uh, or extirpated. There's some arguments about that in the community in the community but they look pretty similar to these guys and uh they're they're almost like a little tortoise they're pretty terrestrial for for a turtle he's uh, quite shy actually usually. i love the carapace markings yeah they're really really gorgeous they kind of have like star markings on them when you kind of turn on there it's mm -hmm. awesome so neat i'm gonna put him back so he's getting my uh, table dirty there. Sounds good. I've got a few more questions for when you're back. Perfect. Awesome. Uh, for the animals I'll probably show today, uh, again, a couple of them are in shed and probably don't want to be handled right now. That's definitely fair. Um, speaking of shedding, someone was wondering why snake shed and what does that mean? Um, so snake shed just as uh, humans do. So we shed a little bit differently, so we're always shedding our skin in little tiny like microscopic pieces. Uh, the snakes, they don't do that. They shed it all at once, and that just means that they're growing. So they're literally um, outgrowing their skins. Cool. How regularly does that happen? So it changes with uh, age. So older snakes, they, they're not growing as often. Or sorry, they're not growing as quickly, um, so they're not shedding 
as much. Now, younger snakes, uh, they can shed every few days. It also mm -hmm. depends on how much they're eating as well. That makes sense. Neat. Um, Joan was mentioning that they saw a very large, at least four foot, colorful snake. Um, and it was much bigger than a rat snake. And they're wondering what it could have been. Um, like, there's not much that uh, would be bigger than a rat snake. Uh, so rat snakes, again, they get very large, over six feet. Um, a large colorful snake, I could maybe imagine like a, a, a large milk snake, they can get maybe three and a half feet. Um, and again, they can be kind of bright orange. Um, other than that, I'm not too sure what it could have been other than maybe a possible escaped pet. Hmm. Interesting. Um, Hannah was very thankful for the live show and tell. Thank you <laughs> for doing course. that. I know I also very much enjoyed it. Um, and then someone else was wondering if snakes like dark places and if turtles have pretty, if other turtles have pretty patterns on their shelves. So not just the box turtles. No, there are many turtles that have quite pretty patterns. So um, the Blanding's turtles, the one that I posted a photo of on the uh, observation of the wanted slide there, that was a really pretty individual. So they have yellow kind of flecking on their shells. Um, spotted turtles, they're really pretty. So they're very, they're, I think our smallest turtle species in competition with the musk turtle. Um, and they have a black carapace with perfect yellow circles and they're really, really gorgeous. Cool. Um, and then do snakes like dark places? They do. Um, so again, usually when you're looking for snakes, uh, it depends what type of snake and what time of day, of course. Um, so, you know, snakes, they like to bask in the sun to thermoregulate. Um, but when they're hiding, they love dark, um, tight places to make them feel safe. Cool. Um, I have a question. You mentioned that the smooth green snake is your favorite. Why is it that? Um, I think they're my favorite just because, uh, well, they, they kind of look out of place in Ontario. They look somewhat tropical. Um, so they're bright, vibrant green. Uh, I've always had a lot of troubles finding them before I found my first one. Mm -hmm. So they, they gave me a run for my money. I, I have troubles finding them still a lot of the times. Um, they're understudied species as well. So there's just a lot about them that is really, really interesting. Um, excuse me. They, they also are an, an insectivore. So they eat insects compared to other snakes where a lot of them don't do that. Um, so they're just a really cool um, snake that kind of looks out of place on Ontario. Cool. Um, the K family was mentioning that they have snakes that live under boulders in their yard. So yep. exciting. exactly. So that's what snakes do. They like to find um, a lot of them will hide under rocks and uh, boards and logs. Um, you know, it's how they hide away and stay safe when they're not out basking and, and uh, hunting. Very cool. Um, those are all the questions that I have so far. If anyone else has any, feel free to keep sending them in the chat. Um, but thank you again so much, Kenny, for letting us see your live reptile collection um, of course. and for educating us. Of oh, course. Um, Anne was wondering what are predators of Ontario snakes? Um, so there's countless predators. Uh, a few big ones are, um, you know, birds. Um, so birds will pick up small snake species. Uh, lots of mammals, fish will eat them. A lot of snakes are really low. Um, on that food chain list. So really anything larger than a snake could uh, eat one. Interesting. I did not know that. Yeah. Um, Hannah's saying thank you from, including from eight-year-old Jackson. <laughs> of course. Thank you guys for watching. Watch um, this code in our yard. <laughs> Yeah, um, the K family said that they've seen a snake eat a toad in their yard, um, but that their uncle said that they don't usually eat toads. Is that your experience? So um, garter snakes will eat toads pretty commonly, um, but not many other species of toads do have toxin, toxins. Um, so a lot of animals can't handle that, uh, but garter snakes are pretty impressive, so they do that. Cool. Um, Joan was mentioning that also dogs and family pets are um, snake predators. Yeah, so that's that's uh, another thing, you know, um, cats, of course, are a huge predator to uh, snakes and any uh, native, native wildlife and people let their cats outdoors or feral cats, um, you know, off leash dogs can do some damage as well, for sure. Hmm. Um, and then another question, what are some predators of turtles? Um, turtles, so one big one is uh, like otters. 
Now, when turtles are a bit older, so I'm just gonna grab my drink here. Um, older turtles don't really have many predators. When once they get past that stage, um, once they're older, like once they're overwintering and stuff, that's when they get predated by otters and stuff like that. Young turtles have a lot of predators. So they have a lot of tur uh, <laughs> turtles hurdles to get over um, before they get to that point, of course. Um, so really, anything can eat a young turtle fish, birds, mammals. Um, and of course, when they get older, cars is now um, the biggest threat to adult turtles. Mm -hmm. Joan's agreeing with you, saying that people are the worst for turtles. Yeah, for sure. And then you've got, oh, sorry. Um, you've got another thank you from the K family, from Noah, age nine, and Lily, age seven, and their mom, all the way from Pennsylvania. Oh, the States. Yeah. I'd say uh, maybe when the COVID stuff is over, you guys can come visit and see it in person at Little Lake sometime. That would be very cool. Awesome. Um, that's still all the questions that I have. So thank you again. Um, I can keep monitoring the chat box to see if any more come in. Um, oh, another okay. one. Awesome. <laughs> um, Gary says, have you ever been to the Amazon or tropical places to see bigger snakes? Um, I haven't. Uh, I haven't done too much traveling. When I have, I wasn't looking um, for reptiles and amphibians, unfortunately. So I've done a lot of local looking for them, um, but no, I haven't been to the tropics, no. Cool. Um, and the K family is hoping to visit Elbow, so that is really exciting to hear. It's a cool place in my opinion. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's, it's a great spot. We're just there today actually looking for stuff. So oh, awesome. Um, and then Joan was also saying thank you. Thank you guys for joining. And some more thank yous. Oh wait, I can see a chat there now. Awesome. Well, I think that's all the questions we have. So thank you so much everyone for tuning in. Um, again, you can visit Kenny at Reptile and Amphibian Advocacy on social media and at his website. Um, and feel free to email him if you have any observations and can participate in that. Yeah. Um, and we hope you have a good rest of your night. Thanks, everyone.